Hello, I'm Calvin. Here's Sol. Oh, Misa Bomba, muy, muy, muchas gracias, Calvin. <laughs> and, uh, and Alan. Uh, hello. Yes, and today we're going to be talking about the Star Wars prequels, which is Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, and Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. I'm I'm really excited about this one. Oh, me too. Why are you excited, though? Because I've been wanting to do this one for ages. I So, we did Star Wars, the Star Wars trilogy, the real Star Wars trilogy. The proper ones, yes. A while back. If you haven't heard that episode, I suppose you should probably go and listen to it right now. Dimreturns.com. Yeah, everyone who remembers that will remember that Alan and myself are not the biggest Star Wars fans in the world. Though we can acknowledge that, you know, the, the original trilogy, they're alright. <laughs> That's more praise than you gave them in the actual episode. The, the first one's alright. Yeah, the first one's alright. The, 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 the next two are shit. No, they're not. Yeah, they're okay, they're, they're not amazing. They're not... Uh, and anyway, uh, the prequels are generally regarded as pieces of total arse. So, Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be very... Well, I'm very intrigued to hear what Alan thinks of it. I hadn't watched these films since they came out, I should add, in the cinema. So, this was the first time I've revisited any of them. Interesting. I have no nostalgia attached to the original Star Wars trilogy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I do have nostalgia attached to The Phantom Menace. Mm. Because I was nine when this film came out, and I went Perfect to see age. it, and I, I played all the video games, and I had the Jar Jar Binks sticky heads that mm. everyone had about five of. And mm. and another reason being, this is a spoiler for an upcoming episode, because we haven't mentioned, actually, this is the start of our Star Wars season. We're, we're not just doing the prequels, we're, we're doing the prequels this week, then we're doing Rogue One, and then we're doing The Force Awakens. Mm. Um, and a spoiler, sort of, for our Force Awakens episode, but not really, because I've mentioned it repeatedly throughout this podcast. I'm not a big fan of The Force Awakens, and I was genuinely expecting to go into this, or rather, I was, I was genuinely expecting to come away from this revisit, thinking that the prequels were better than The Force Awakens. Whether or not that was the case i i will stay let tuned you, to find yeah that. listen <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's interesting so that you you say you're ex- you were excited to do this, this episode because um i've i've seen these films before years ago i couldn't really remember any details so i've watched them again and due to my poor time management i i i watched phantom menace a couple of days ago and the other two films i've watched today back to back Ooh. And quite frankly, I'm very depressed, uh, and, oh. and it's just really put me in a bad mood. I'm very subdued, and it's um, it's not just that it's not that they're bad. It was just that they were so utterly boring and devoid of anything. Yeah, it's not done me any good at all. Yeah. <laughs> so so, uh, so let's get into it. <laughs> Cheer me up. I, I'll I'll say that I'm the biggest fan of the series, as has already been said. Um, I go to the original trilogy quite a lot. I love The Force Awakens. Um, Rogue One we'll get to. Uh, the prequel trilogy, I only ever revisit when I'm doing, like, you know, a watch through of the whole saga or whatever. What order do you do? Uh, four, five, six, one, two, three, which is obviously the order that George Lucas advises against, because he would rather go <laughs> one to six, oh, which really? is stupid, and we'll talk yeah. about why. Yeah, I mean, obviously production order makes the most sense, but yeah. if I was a massive Star Wars fan, I, I know I would try doing chronologically, just out of interest at some oh. point. I mean, it, it's. I mean, it's fine. I get because stylistically the two trilogies are so different. But mm. it so it's so jarring mm. when you get to the end of three and you're going to oh, four. I don't know. They're not that different. I, I we'll we'll get into it. Um, I think that episode one feels the most like the original trilogy, and a large part of that mm. is because there's actual sets and yes. you know silly masks and that kind mm. of thing. It's not yeah, just yeah. all on a green screen like the other two. Anyway, before we get into it, we're going to go through the films um, scene by scene. Um, But I guess just to set the context uh, for which The Phantom Menace was born into, it came two years after George Lucas revisited the original trilogy to produce the special editions, which where he went in and tinkered with it and put in deleted scenes and new CGI enhancements and all that kind of thing. Now, Um, was that a warm-up exercise he wanted to do just to kind of get ready, or do you think doing that made him think, yeah, you know what, I enjoyed that so much, I want to make this prequel series now? I think it was probably a bit of both. um, Because, yeah, I mean, his whole justification for doing 
episode one when he did it was because the technology had finally caught up with the vision that he had for this universe so he could do armies of droids and weird aliens and all that kind of thing and certainly there's a lot of experimental stuff in those special editions where he was like testing out the technology but then it's it's George Lucas you know you never he says so many contradictory things on one interview he'll say oh yes I had this whole thing planned out and I intended on doing it this way and waiting all this time and blah 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 and then in other interviews he'll be like well I needed money for this business Adventure, so I decided. Mm, that yeah, I that to. seems like a more likely. Answer. Because bearing in mind, this this was his return to directing for the first time since that at first Star Wars film, mm, since Episode Four. Yeah. He hadn't directed anything in twenty two years. But it's like riding a bike, isn't it? <laughs> if you could never do it in the first place, you still can't do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I made my feelings on that clear in the in our other podcast. Mm. I think the the two best Star Wars films are the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the ones where he had the least involvement. <laughs> Well, I mean that's incorrect, but <laughs> but in terms of directing, maybe. we um we start episode one. Bearing in mind, like I don't think it can be um overstated, like how big a deal this was for a lot of people. Like, what was it, sixteen years after the last film, fifteen years? Yeah, re- remember remember what it was like when the Force Awakens came out. It was that, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Can I ask a question before it starts? Right. The Phantom Menace. Ah. What's that about? What does that mean? Because there wasn't any phantoms or menaces. Well, he's a holographic emperor, isn't he? So he's almost like a phantom. Yeah. Or Darth Maul is a menace. He's metaphorically a a phantom presence because he's not like... He's pulling strings. He's not directly involved. Is that what it's referring to? I mean, I, I don't... As a title, it's it, it flows, it's catchy, it kind of makes an impact. I just don't find it particularly relevant. Like Attack of the Clones, I get that. Whatever the other one is, Revenge of the Sith. Well, what are they getting revenge for? Um, Being killed and wiped hmm. out previously. Getting getting attacked in the next film set afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. But there's history there, isn't there? There's previous. Yeah. Anyway, I don't. I think Phantom Menace is a good name. I think it works well enough. I just, I just have no idea what it's referring to. Yeah. I'd rather have that yeah. than Attack of the Clones, which just is a dreadful name for a film. Yeah. So we get quite possibly the most um, dull opening crawl of any Star Wars film. Wouldn't it have made more sense if there was no opening crawl whatsoever? Yes, because that was where I was leading. One. Yes, I would have loved that. I would have absolutely loved that. Like the whole point of having the opening crawl at the start of Episode Four was that you're supposed to be like thrown right into the middle of a story. Yeah, because he was he was previously he was spoofing Flash Gordon, the old yeah. serials, yeah. which exactly. did it previously on. Yes. Opening crawl. Whereas here, like you say, it's the very start. So, and also, I mean, a lot of what happens for the next like hour is relatively inconsequential. I, I would argue that the <laughs> story doesn't really get started until they actually get to Tatooine and meet the young boy. Mm, yeah, you could have just started with them crash landing on the desert planet, and then they go and meet him, and this film goes from there. But um, anyway, the first hour, let's go through that. All right, so we. We open on our new uh, protagonists, Liam Neeson mm. and Ewan McGregor. So yes. Liam Neeson in... This is probably going to be my second uh, controversial opinion of the episode. The first being that Star Wars, the original trilogy, is not that great. Number two being that uh, this might be Liam Neeson's best performance. <laughs> because he's shit. Haven't you seen Schindler's List? No, to be fair, I haven't seen Schindler's List. But I have seen him in loads of stuff where he's like, meant to be great, and he's so shit. Every time I see him in something, he's so shit. Whereas here, he's just this, like, you know, this this dry, mechanical old Jedi <laughs> master, and it works. He was having a miserable time on on the set. That's traditional, though, because that's, that's the Alec Guinness school of exactly. Star Wars, isn't it? <laughs> I think it comes across, and it just seems like he's a Jedi master. He's not allowed to enjoy himself, like most people <laughs> in religious authority. Was he annoyed that there were no other actors there? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, compared to the prequel, to the other two um, in the prequel trilogy, there was actual actors there. But bearing in mind that this was at the start of sort of CGI fests, uh, you know, like actors weren't used to the idea of okay, well, I'm just going to go to work today and be on a green screen set. Yeah, you you mean to tell me that. Liam Neeson didn't jump at the chance to test his acting skills to the max degree by acting opposite a couple of ping pong balls painted <laughs> yellow, going, Misa, so happy to see you. Surprisingly <laughs> enough, no. Uh, anyway, so Ewan McGregor, love him. Probably my favourite thing in the whole prequel trilogy. He, I, I like Ewan McGregor. Doesn't do anything particularly amazing here. Yeah, well, he's, I think, he's, I think what he's, can you do with the material? I think he looks like the only one who's actually enjoying himself in the cast. Oh, I don't Everyone know about else that. Looks miserable. I think oh, he you... comes across like he's 
he's there to do a job, he's learned his lines, and he wants to get home before six if he can help it. Oh no, I think I think he's having fun with it. I think he's he's got a twinkle. I'll tell you who's having fun with it is Warwick Davis in that pod racing scene where he's got like, oh, yeah. three roles and you can tell there's yeah. like a thing that's him in a mask, but then he pops up without a mask on in the background and he's so happy. You can tell it's <laughs> like, it means the world to him to be back doing a Star Wars film. Well, so they bring lovely. him back for every single Star Wars film. Like, he's he's in pretty much all of them. He was in Rogue One. There's like two different little animals or creatures or whatever. Well, I wouldn't want to be the first guy to not put him in a Star Wars film. So do you two understand what's going on in these first few scenes? Because so he's training up the Jedi, the young mm. Padawan, and... Uh, yes, he's training up Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. And they're going to meet some racist aliens, the first yes. of many, who are like, <laughs> Oh, hello! We are from a great trade federation! Oh, it's great <laughs> honour to, to be with you as aliens! We are aliens! <laughs> we are not based on any Earth culture! <laughs> oh, yeah. it's so bad! It is and, and you watch it and you th- and you think, well, maybe they're like, you know, maybe it's like James Hong or someone. And you look it up; it's some Welsh guy. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it's even more jarring in the other films where they have that same like alien species come back, and because in this film they're quite firmly established as having a particular way of speaking. Yeah, it hasn't aged well, has it? <laughs> no, no. But like all this stuff, like I think I only really understood what was going on when I came back to the film as an adult because. Oh yeah, I I I didn't know what this was when I was a kid. I was just like, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, Droidica. Like... I loved those Droidica as a kid, though. How cool are they? Oh, yeah, they, they were good. They were good. Droid- when they cool. go, the Droidica. The droidy cars. Those rolling droids that have the shields. They roll in, and then they put oh, a yeah. force field up, and then they go, pew, 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 out of the force field. Had that yeah. toy. They're pretty cool. So, this is point one in favour of The Phantom Menace being better than The Force Awakens. Uh, there's actually some really cool new like creature designs and robot designs in this, Droidica <laughs> being one. There's plenty of new creature designs in The Force Awakens. No, 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 I said cool new creature um, designs. Fair enough, okay. Yep. And BB-8 pops up in this prequel trilogy, that little rolling droid, they just ripped that off. Does it? Oh yeah, I've I've definitely made a note of it, I'll get to it when we get to the note, I guess. The battle droids are cool as well though, aren't they? They're really cool. Nice design. Yeah. They're much better looking than stormtroopers. Yeah. Oh no, no. Stormtroopers no. it's just a knobhead in a in a helmet. Yeah, this is the whole thing that they um the logic of having droids as soldiers makes a lot of sense and like coming from the real world where combat is going more and more that way into uh, drones then artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff mm. whereas in star wars the idea is that they go from droids to clones and then clones to people yeah but star wars is set in bizarro world because the fu- it's in the future but it's actually the past so mm. everything's backwards in Star Wars land. Ah, true, true. I can tell you exactly why they realised that having droids as soldiers was a bad idea. Because you, you knock out a computer and they all just stop working simultaneously. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Which makes for a very easy, comfortable, clean ending. Um, <laughs> anyway, they, they, they... So what is it? A trade deal goes wrong or something and they run away and they... No, yeah. the, tr- the Trade Federation are doing a, th- a blockade, but it's all a cover for essentially inciting... The war. And they, they go to Gungan land. Yes. Now this, I mean, that's a highlight. Right. We've managed to go about 15, 20 minutes without talking about Jar Jar. 15 to 20 minutes without specking about Jar Jar. <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously this uh, film Moy, is... Moy, did you spec? Mm. Excuse me, Calvin. So obviously the film is rather <laughs> infamous because of this character that George Lucas wrote uh, uh, intended as this lovable comic relief character that everyone was going to fall in love with and then would be killed in episode 3 by Anakin Skywalker oh, to show man. his descent into darkness. Oh, that would have been so um, great. Uh, no, it wouldn't because everyone would have cheered when Jar Jar <laughs> was, would eventually be no, killed so that he had to leave him alive. Right, th- right. Genuinely, the, the controversial opinion number 3. Oh god. Jar Jar Binks probably the best thing about the Phantom Menace. He's the only element that works. I I mean I, I can't even I mean he 
<laughs> he ruins every single scene he's in. And he's in, like, every scene. How is he any different to an Ewok? But Ewoks aren't in every scene. That's the, that, that's the problem with Jar Jar. Well, Jar Jar's not literally... in every scene. He's not in it nearly enough. If he had been in more of it, it would have been great. From when he's introduced, he's in, I would say, 80 to 85% of scenes. And in every scene, he's, you know, they're having a conversation at a dinner table and he's in the background, like, slurping on some juice and then falling over or... Jar Jar is the only endearing character in the whole film. No. The other characters are just boring and shit. I've got to, uh, I've got to come down on Soul side on this. I thought it was all right. <sighs> what? He's, he, right, he's become, genuinely, he's become a scapegoat for this film. This film is shit, and yeah. it is not because of Jar Jar. And there's a lot of problems with this film that's not about Jar Jar. Oh, he's not, he's not the worst element in it. And, and the scenes you're talking about, where he, like, gets into a fight with a droid or something, it happens maybe, like, five times in the course of a two-hour movie. I think, you know what my main problem with him is? He, he he has no arc. There's no journey for him in this entire film. And Yeah, because George Lucas At the end, had such a backlash. He's leading he... this army. He's leading the Gungan army to fight the droids and all this kind of stuff. And that should have been his turning point moment to become a hero. And instead, when, you know, the droids come and say, hands up, and his mate's like, come on, Jar Jar, we'll fight to the end. He's like, for the sake of a cheap gag, he's like throwing his arms up in the air, surrendering. What's Natalie Portman's uh, story arc, character arc? I'm not, I didn't, did I say that I like her in this film? <laughs> I'm just, uh, no, I'm making the point that no one has an arc in this film, because they're all, um, ge- it's one of these films that's designed as part of a trilogy and suffers for Obi-Wan it. Obi-Wan and, and Jar Jar probably would have had an arc if you had let him have his two subsequent films, but George Lucas wussed out and was like, all right, we won't have as much Jar Jar now. Sorry. <laughs> but in that first film, he's there as comic relief, and that's what he does. He does a couple of pratfalls, he a does couple. a silly voice, and it's like, this fil- it's a film for nine-year-olds, that's what they like. Yeah, and as a I kid, I loved is. Jar Jar, and I bet you did too. I didn't mind him as a kid. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. As a kid, I really That's it, it was it, a like kid's it. movie, it works for kids. Yeah, 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 no, I, yeah. I agree, but I'm an adult watching this now, and... Well, series... that's the issue, really, isn't it? That's the problem. But but the only reason you like the Ewoks is because, like, everyone was a kid when that came out in the 80s, is now an adult, so somehow that one gets let off the hook. But all those Gen Xers kick off about Jar Jar because they can't comprehend that perhaps nostalgia's tainting their worldview somewhat. Ewoks do not get let off the hook at all. They're, um, yeah, no, they're, uh, much, um... Uh, hated part of that film. Um, I mm. like them because I re- I like I think they're nice and fluffy and cuddly and they look sweet and I think it's quite cute that it's this primitive race of teddy bears that overcome an empire in the last episode. I think the underwater kingdom of the Gungans is visually very nicely designed. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think going underwater is quite a nice you know, thing that we hadn't seen yep. in Star Wars before. Jar Jar takes the Jedis down to his king, whatever Brian Blessed is, and then they get a ship because they need to sw- they need to travel through the planet core to get to the Naboo, who are the um, species, uh, humans, basically, who inhabit the other half of this planet because they need to get to Queen Amidala on the other side. It's probably worth noting that there's some very ropey CGI in this film. Well, do you know what? Actually, I thought... In the first film, it was pretty solid, especially for the time it mm. was made. But then in the second and third films, it, it, it felt really, really shoddy. And I don't know if that was... It, it seemed to get significantly worse. I don't know if that's just because there's so much more of it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's exactly it. Because at least in episode one, they were still filming on mostly built sets... Um, I think they built all of the sets to like six foot in height and then they extended it with CG, but then they were building them all to six foot tall and then they cast Liam Neeson and added an extra foot onto what they were building because he's so tall. Uh, but yeah, I, and that's one of the reasons why, I'll say this now, I think episode one is the best film in the prequel trilogy. You're wrong. Get out. A a large, (laughs) are you you gonna... Disagree with me on this? Uh, absolutely, I'm going to disagree with that. But I guess we'll wait until we get on to the other films. God, well, I have I... to say, Calvin, I'm on your side from that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I think part of that is stylistically, this feels more 
Star Wars, it feels like it's part of that series. I like the... I'll some of the masks that. look really stupid, and some of the CG's a bit ropey, but it still feels like it's part of that universe. Yeah, yeah. It, it I, feels I, like I a relatively fun child's adventure film. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I, yeah. that's what this film feels like. It's just, it's not very good, but then I don't like the Star Wars. Yeah, I was going to say so. fun might not be quite the right word to use. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, we're, we're, we're soon introduced to uh, Queen Padme and her posse. Yes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not Queen Padme, it's Queen Amidala mm. and Handmaid Padme. Mm. Could you tell um, which one was which? The whole gang. Natalie Portman, Kira Knightley, Sofia Coppola. Is Sofia Coppola one of them? Yeah. I had no idea. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so another, actra- uh, another actor who hated um, being in these films, Natalie Portman. And another one who made it startlingly obvious. Yeah. <laughs> she's not good at hiding it, is she? We, we discussed it on our Thor episode. She's mm. not good at hiding when she just cannot be fucked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you'd think in this one, at least, I mean, what was she, like, 16? Something like that? You'd think uh, she'd be a bit excited at this point, and maybe as she got older, she... Yeah, I mean, uh, if nothing else, it's a big job, isn't it? You know, you're gonna, it's gonna make your career. Oh, or yeah. At least put you in the, put you in the, in the forefront of everyone's minds. Mm, mm. Anyway, so all of this has been kind of pointless because the Jedi go and they save Queen Amidala. She's been held hostage and they escape with her and they try to, they fly out to the outer reach of the galaxy, um, but their ship is broken. So they land on Tatooine, the planet that we first saw in episode four and have to go out and look for spare parts. Um, by this point, they've got R2-D2. Oh, I was so angry. I was fuming. Oh, what? Why? Hey, remember this guy from the other films? It's R two D two. Way. Yeah, I mean, there's the... a lot of that in this song. Oh, it was so it was worse than I remembered. I because I guess I wasn't that aware of like tackiness <laughs> as a child. Mm. Um, I I know originally we were meant to run into Han Solo and Wookie as kids hanging out. Yeah, but that was cut. But I think there's still too much of it in the film. Oh, there's far too much. And one of the common criticisms I've read about this prequel trilogy is that uh, it makes the universe, the entire universe, feel really small. Because anyone that is important comes about... But Like, the fact that Anakin, who becomes Darth Vader, built C-3PO from scratch. And that, oh, R2 was just on the Queen's ship, and then he comes along and... Funny that they all became interconnected later on in life, isn't it? Yeah, just all this coincidence that people... Oh, look, it's that guy again. Mm. Uh, we're, we're then introduced to Watto, who's uh, Ooh, strike yes. three on the incredibly like awkward racial stereotype <laughs> characters in this film. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a question. Okay. Number... Well, was, was Omid Jajalili busy? <laughs> He wasn't who he was then. This is years before The Mummy Returns or whatever. Whichever no, it isn't. Was. It was the same year. It's the same the year mummy. as The Mummy. Yeah, but this was filmed like two years before, wasn't it? Was The Mummy not filmed a couple of years before? I don't know. This was filmed in London, Pinewood, largely. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe he was busy doing The Mummy. Maybe when I'm going with The Mummy, I don't I don't think Star Wars is going to uh, be a big hit. Yeah. So Watto's racist, right? Mm, well... <sighs> Yeah, it was a yeah. different time. We didn't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. It's one of those things you could probably get away with that if you had cast someone who wasn't a Welsh man again, a white Welsh guy. <laughs> if you cast like Ben Kingsley and said like, just ham it up, you'd be alright because it's like, yeah, you know, he's doing it's Ben Kingsley. You can't complain. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. Then we're introduced to to. Uh, more like Mannequin Skywalker. Oh. <laughs> Am I right, guys? Yeah, Jake Lloyd, 10-year-old Anakin Skywalker, 10-year-old Darth Vader, like, the whole point of going back and doing the prequels in the first place to tell the story of this guy. Yeah, and you, and you know what? People slag him off and act like he's the worst actor in the world. I think he's fine. As far as child actors go, he's not amazing, but he's certainly equal, you know, he, he stands toe-to-toe with the other actors in this film. <laughs> you, can, you, can say, you can say he's a bad actor. He's not even the worst actor to play Anakin Skywalker in this trilogy. Yeah, oh, so... that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, he's not even the worst actor in this film. His performance is better than the likes of Natalie Portman. And we know that Natalie Portman is a good actor. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a worse performance in the sense that Natalie Portman definitely can do better. He might be doing the best he can do. But I don't, I don't know about that. If if this is what we're judging him on, poor guy, he might be the best actor in the world, and he's only got this George Lucas directed performance to. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously exactly. 
you, especially when it comes to kids, you need to direct them more, mm. if anything. So, yeah, I, I, it, it certainly seems like he's been given no direction whatsoever. I don't think anyone was. And then, and then C-3PO's there. Yeah, <sighs> my favourite character. Isn't that really shit again? Doesn't it? Like, even you're a big fan of him showing up just for the hell of it, but surely even you <sighs> can appreciate that it kind of takes away from him to know that he was mates with Darth Vader as a kid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's just... That's craziness. I mean, I know they, at the end of episode three, they just start kind of write it all out. Well, George Lucas rather writes it all out by having a character say, oh, wipe the droid's uh, memory. And that's supposed to be all right. They don't wipe R2's memory. So R2-D2 knows everything. No, yeah. So when, yeah, he comes face to... Now she just made to come face to face with C-3PO. Not after he's been made up all gold and shit. No, I don't think he does in the other trilogy. You might see him from afar. But yeah, you would sort of think, oh, look at that. They are all gold. But it is, it's just, it's just so cheap, isn't it? It's just yeah, like, yeah, it is. we've got to put him in. Yeah. It's pathetic. And they've already given yeah. us R2-D2. Yeah. I mean, they just can't go a film without having, like, Warwick Davis, Anthony Daniels, and Kenny Baker come back. And Kenny Baker barely even came back to be an R2. Like, he's mainly uh, remote controlled at this point. They just have him back and put him in it for one shot as, like, a lucky talisman sort of thing. Have his name in the credits. It's like if Warwick Davis had reprised his role as an Ewok. Yeah, yeah. George Lucas would always say that thing about, like, how... And I, I take issue with it. That the whole Star Wars saga is from the perspective of the droids... And it's through no, their it's eyes that we experience story. I think maybe you could maybe make a case for episode four being that way. Yes. But the rest of them after that, it's like, no, they're not privy to a lot of <laughs> crucial scenes and moments. Uh, Does George Lucas just make it all up as he goes along? Like, every interview yep. he says something different just to wind people yep. up? Quite possibly, yeah. Yep. See, if he's doing that just to annoy nerds, I, I can go with that. I don't think he is. I, I think he's just... Well, a, I think he's just a liar. That's it. I think he's just a compulsive liar who kind of believes it after he says it and mm. just builds mm. a reality around him where he goes, oh yeah, no, I thought to do that. Yeah, yeah, I'm really clever, me. You know how clever I am? This one time, I was I was going around the racetrack, and they left a ramp out, and uh, everyone was going, oh my god, oh my god, he's definitely going to die. I hit it, I did a, a flip in the air, landed on my wheels, pulled over, said, what were you worried about? <laughs> uh, was yep. that to segue into the pod race segment of the film? <laughs> uh, no, because cause there's about half an hour... 45 minutes just of them sat in the desert before just going, oh, <laughs> there's a pod race in a few days. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to, we're going to go to this pod race? Yeah, I think we should. Um, I'm handing out flyers for the pod race in a few days if you want to come along. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come along. How much is it? Oh, it's two Quatloos. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was Star Trek. Actually, quite lose. Oh, maybe. Uh, so no, this is this is like when um, this is working on a TV show. They go, "Oh no, we've broken the neighbor's uh, greenhouse. It's going to cost two hundred pounds to replace it." Oh, look, a poster. Um, a talent show, grand prize, two hundred pounds. Well, <laughs> let's put a band together. It reminds me of like some kind of role playing game where you get given an objective and it's like, okay, in order to do that, I need to go here and do that to win that to get that to come back to the top. Yeah, grind for experience on the... kind of yeah, yeah because I mean I, I I think this whole pod racing the actual race is very exciting mm. and it's all lo- looks great mm. but it's you, you can't get over the feeling that it's all just sort of futile and I think the whole point of it is I guess to show that Anakin is a great pilot I think the but... whole point of it is George Lucas when oh man I want to do that scene from Ben Hur well yeah, yeah. oh and, and we can do a tie-in video game uh, just built around that one scene that video game was brilliant do you not love some of the other people in the well the aliens yeah again the again exactly great designs of characters you would not find anything close to the quality of that in the force awakens I love Ben Quadraneros the one who's uh thing doesn't start up and he's like sat there while others lap him yeah but then they don't get any they don't get any real ca- characterization they're just sort of interesting design yeah it's wacky characters. races yeah but that's <laughs> it. you could do you could do an entire film where they crash land on a planet and then this young slave boy they they all work together to win the pod race so that he can get away and then they discover mm. his magic, and that sets up the sequel where he becomes mm. magic. Boy. And there we go. Mm. So that is the big, the big bit of exposition. The the reason I suppose that they waste so much time getting to the pod race in the first place 
uh, is so they can have a big discussion about midichlorians. So Ugh. everyone had been everyone had been anxiously wondering what on earth is the force magic? <laughs> but isn't it science fiction? I thought there were aliens in spaceships. How can they be doing magic? Well, I'll tell you why," said George, uh, scratching <laughs> his his wise man's stubble. Midichlorians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate that. Uh, how did you? How did you two feel as non-fans? Does it bother you in any way? Does it nah. have any kind of impact? You just don't all, care. Well, I mean, objectively, I will concede that it is unnecessary and silly and detracts from uh, some of the mystique that exists for people about what the Jedi are and everything. Uh, mm. But. On a personal level, I don't really give a shit either way. Mm. I'd probably cut the scene Alan? for time if I was in charge. <laughs> it irritates me that you can tell who's a Jedi by a blood test. Yeah, seems... I think it'd be better if you could train to become a Jedi. It has more of a spiritual sense. It's mm. like tapping into something that's within us all. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but it's about finding it. But haven't we all got midichlorians in our blood? So we all can and we can cultivate those I mean, Anakin's are off the chart. Yeah, it's just Anakin's, so <laughs> Anakin's the chosen one. But that's a He's riddled with that's them. a common trope, isn't it? He's got full blown mm. midichlorians. Um, but then we get to the pod race. So uh, I, I've Greg Proops as the commentator. Isn't that yeah. weird? Isn't that an oddly meta, self aware choice for Star Wars to basically be doing a parody of something on Earth? Uh, Doesn't that feel like it completely breaks the Star Wars universe as it's been established up until this point to just have a guy being like, "Wow, we've got a great show for you today." You know, he does nothing against what he's doing. He does it fine. It's just a weird choice, I think. I think it's completely mm. out of tone with Star Wars as it's been established as a universe. And so much about this scene bothered me from a nerdy point of view. If I cared about Star Wars, yeah. I would have been fuming. Because we're meant to believe oh. these spectators go and pay money to watch a race on iPads in the stalls. You ever seen Formula One? I guess that is just what people do, isn't it? People spend big money going to see But that. then also, this scene categorically proves that video technology exists within the Star Wars universe. So mm. th the idea that 20 years down the line, Jedi like records are so forgotten, everyone thinks the Jedi aren't even real, it's just a myth that like mum used to tell me when I was going to bed at night. You'd have like YouTube clips of them doing lightsabers. Anakin's mum has obviously got a, some kind of VIP box because they all go, they're not in with the regular crowds, they go up some sort of... Um... That's, that's where they put the slaves. Ah. Uh. So th those are the cheap seats. Oh, actually, something about that whole slave thing. Well, yeah, that's another point I wanted to make. Isn't there, th there's a fucking weird subtext about slavery running through this film, and I, I've been holding off addressing it, but like, what what is it with Star Wars and slavery, and particularly this film? Mm. What, why? They're, they're obsessed with it, but they never, like, deal with it properly. But they're upset. Mm. Anakin's a slave. His mum's a slave. Mm. Jar Jar's a fucking slave, because he owes a life debt to Obi-Wan, so Obi-Wan's like, alright, you can be my slave, and he's like, oh, thank you, gracious mm. master. Uh, the droids are slaves? Anakin's got his own slave in the form of C-3PO? What's going on? It's weird. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I think I think about this a lot more now, because I think it was Alan that made the point in our previous Star Wars episode about, like, C-3PO and R2-D2 are just property, and they're mm. just just traded around, they're, you know, given to Jabba the Hutt and whatever. And ever since that, I have looked at them and sort of think, like, oh yeah, I know actually there's a lot of talk of people being property and you're owed to someone else and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's odd. It's just weird. The thing that kind of is introduced in this film that never goes anywhere is the idea that Anakin and his mother, because they are slaves, have some kind of explosive device uh, inside them, and that if they were to try and escape, those devices would explode. And they use that as a reasoning for why Anakin and his mum can't just disappear together, but... That's that kind of setup feels like that's coming back later on somewhere down the line, and they never really explain it. Or you know, I remember at the time thinking that maybe that's how he became Darth Vader because he this chip was set off inside him yeah, and it like yeah. blew up load of his body, and then he became a robot. That's man what he should have done. But no, he should have gone back yeah. and re-edited Return of the Jedi. So at the end, <laughs> his head blows up. Luke presses a button <laughs> on a remote control. He goes no, and his head pops off. <laughs> <laughs> you know this whole this whole pod race thing right because they're doing it to win a bet or whatever liam neeson he tries to do the force thing on 
the flying big nose creature. Watto. So he goes, Yo, you will give us a hyperdrive. And he's like, ah, this is not work on me. I am uh, not a midichlorian proof. <laughs> That's a good impression. <laughs> so the Jedi, the Jedi Force mind control doesn't work on everyone. Okay. No, just on that species. Exactly. So why didn't he go... But well, then why doesn't he go to one of the other species... And go, you want to give us 10,000 quaaludes or whatever they, they use in this <laughs> currency. And, and then just sort of, or steal it. Do you know what I mean? Like, who cares? Well, that <laughs> would be dishon... No, actually, no, that's not as dishonest as just trying to make him give it you anyway, is it? That or the, the other driver who wins all the time. Just go to him and go, you're going to be shit at driving tomorrow. And then or do it like that. <laughs> Like, what, what? I mean, I know why, because it makes it more exciting. But again, just more sloppiness. But the, the pod race itself, and I want to agree with uh, with what you've said, really. I, I liked it. I thought the designs were really good, the pod designs mm. and everything. It felt like I was watching a cartoon, mm. but it, that was all right in that context. Mm. But I didn't, the, the whole sequence was too long. It didn't yeah. particularly excite me. Agreed. And, I, I was enjoying, much like Ben-Hur, I enjoyed it for like three minutes. And then it was like, oh, this is going on a bit. <laughs> it's like, mm. wrap it up. Anyway, my note here, my note here is that BB-8 is in the desert, so it's in this scene. If you want to go back and look, it's it's a little droid sphere, and oh, BB-8 just really? ripped it off. It's the exact same design, practically. Why does Liam Neeson feel the need to take Jar Jar with him? Like that makes no sense. Leave him behind for Because Jar Jar, sa- Jar Jar wants to come with him, and he says, "Oh, you you, you saved my life. I am eternally grateful." <laughs> mm, okay. Yeah, he's like. Liam Neeson's all right. I've got to go on this important thing. I've got to go find a hyperdrive. I'll take the fucking idiot alien and, oh, the queen wants me to take one of her slave girls with me. All right. That'll, that'll really help my situation. <laughs> oh, look, an eight-year-old child. I'll buddy it with him. <laughs> Can I take it? Can I take him? Oh, yeah, he's only my son. Just have him. Go on. I think he might be magic. Oh, by the way, I never had sex with anyone, but then I gave birth to this child. I think Ooh. I was raped by midichlorians. That annoys me a lot. <laughs> so when they're like doing the whole thing of like, right, Anakin, you're going to come with me and you've got to say goodbye to your mum. And, you, and he's like saying to his mum, oh, well, I'll probably never see you again. It's like, bring him home. Like, you're probably only an hour's <laughs> drive away. Bring him home for life yeah. day, at least. Fucking hell. Well, as we learn in... Oh, nice uh, holiday special reference there, Sol. As, as we know, the Jedi are unemotional voids, as the sequels will um, prove. So, yeah, apparently you just can't love anyone if you're a Jedi. You can't give a you're shit. You're not allowed to. It should be the end until he's, like, old enough to come back and free the slaves. But Watto will obviously sell her for the right price. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, it's not like a, probably going to be a high price. It's not like she's a really in-demand slave or anything. So why don't you go off, go to the Jedi Council, like who, who probably have quite significant funds, and just go, <laughs> look, we've got this kid. We're taking care of him now. He's a, he's the special one. Can we get his mum? Freeing his mum will probably be cheaper than hiring a chaperone to look after him all day. Yeah. <laughs> when, because they're not allowed to be alone with him because of yeah. child safety laws. Tell you what, though, that Jedi Council is just full of cameos. It's mad. Is it? You got a cone head in there. You got one of those things from the Argos adverts. <laughs> you got Yoda. And then Samuel L. Jackson, who might as well be playing it as himself. Don't say that like Samuel L. Jackson usually goes really deep into character. I love watching it, <laughs> just imagining that Samuel L. Jackson is the representative of Earth. <laughs> of I'm tired Council. of these motherfucking Sith and my motherfucking <laughs> Republic. And then obviously you've got E.T.'s in the chamber later on, just going oh, on about yes, Reese's yes. Pieces, like cheering. This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is all the stuff on Coruscant, the city planet. Yeah, so this is all quite dull, isn't it? Nothing really happens here. There's um, Terrence Stamp turns up. Oh yeah, Terrence Stamp turns up. He has three lines. Like you've got Terrence Stamp for fuck's sake. Yeah. But yeah, my notes now are: this film is too long. Uh, <laughs> Obi Wan Kenobi utterly pointless in this film. He hasn't done anything. Oh, <laughs> all no, setting no, him I up like for the next one. He, do- he doesn't well, do that- anything in the film. He kills Darth Maul. <sighs> well, that's pointless. They should have just had him introduced. Well, no, it isn't. Having a character tag along for the entire film only so that they can like save the day because of an artificial bit of peril you've written in at the last minute it is bull- bullshit. Just introduce him at the start of Attack of the Clones. Mm, no, because you need <laughs> to see him because he has to have some kind of relationship with his with Anakin, and it's Liam Neeson who sort of tells him, "I know you don't really think much of this kid, but do it for me. You've got to look after him." Oh, and you couldn't and possibly him give him like a scene with Anakin that explains. 
explain that at the start of Attack of the Clones, where he's like fishing with him or something. Well, no, because <laughs> that would that would be that would be hasty and not as satisfying as oh, you've never met me before, but by the way, do you remember me and Liam Neeson? Well, we talked about. But it isn't satisfying this. as it is. It's not I think satisfying. It is. He's no, because he doesn't bond with him in this film. He fucks off to the ship while they're on the desert. No, he's not supposed to bond him in this film. That's the point because it's Liam Neeson. Yeah, so why can't he bond with him boy? in the next one? However long goes past between this film and the second one anyway, it'd be so easy to be like, right, well, this is the guy who's been caring for Anakin, and he's a young man, he's grown up under his care now. But that doesn't mean as much if we don't see him being reluctant to take him on initially here. He doesn't want to take him on. Put a flashback in, the second one. Ugh. <sighs> Just have it. Just have someone go. Look, I know you were reluctant to uh, take the kid on at the start of things, but I think you've been a really good dad, actually. Oh, cheers, mate. I think that's cheap. I think that's a cheap way of doing it. Well, I think it. it's I cheap having have... him just step in to save the day in this film. So, so why did Natalie Portman reveal herself to be queen completely unprompted? Uh, to build trust. Yeah, with the Gungans. But that isn't. That's that's going to do the opposite of build trust. You're saying, look, we're tricksy, devious people, and I've been fucking you over this whole time with this devious scheme. Yeah, but you reveal. But that's it, and you reveal yourself to go look. And if I if I was Brian Blessed, I'd be like, oh, you've been tricking me this whole time. What kind of prick do you take me for? Right, we're out of here. No, because he understands. You know, he, he's probably got a couple of stand-ins when he needs them. Well, Albert Finney. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's because like Kira Knightley's going like, um. Yeah, um, you can have everything. She's like, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> I'm the queen. Um, don't don't <laughs> listen to her. Uh, this is the thing. Like her handmaidens impersonate her for a long time. She basically has unelected officials doing her uh, doing her bidding. But then I, I suppose politics is kind of screwed up when she's a she's a queen, but she's elected, and she talks about being the youngest elected official in like the history of that society. I mean, what the that that raises more questions than it answers. <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to see her election campaign? Yeah, I want to see that. that film. I do. What? That's one of the spin offs I want. I genuinely, this 15 year <laughs> I mean, you could do it in a post Trump era. That's the kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Uh, I remember loving the big Gungan battle as a kid, and I, I was very glad on the rewatch when we finally got back to the Gungans. Hover tanks and force fields and stuff. I stopped making notes after the pod race, so it was obviously where I just stopped trying at all. Uh, so I don't know what else happened after The that. big rack of droids <laughs> unfolds. Oh, I like in that. In Roman formations. Mm. And there's those cool blue spheres that seem to like knock out electronic equipment Boom, in some capacity. So this, this was quite a cool scene. I, I honestly, even on the rewatch, I thought, you know what, this is coming to life again for this sequence. It's not too bad. This. I really like this whole climax. You've got that battle going on. You've got a space battle. You've got the Jedi fighting with Darth Maul. That's a really cool fight. And Jewel of the Fates. Great, like genuinely Incredible. wonderful piece of music written by John Williams. Yeah. The, up there with the work he did on the, you know, first two films. Mm. I, I I agree, and it all works out like this huge battle is this decoy, and then but then I don't I didn't like that Anakin kind of accidentally flies into battle and <laughs> saves mm. everyone. Yeah, that's a fun and, fun oh. kids movie kind of thing. I didn't yeah. mind it too much. I, I wish, I'm fine with him accidentally getting into the battle, but the fact that he accidentally saves the yeah. day by accidentally firing at the, like, the main bloody reactor. Well, it'd be alright if R2-D2 was able to wink at camera at the end of it. <laughs> like it was all him. I would have been fine with that, actually, if, you know, he'd been controlling things or helped out or something, I don't know. My last note is I hate to admit it, but I think it is actually worse than The Force Awakens. So, there we go. <laughs> oh. Well, best of the prequel trilogy by no my um, reckoning. Fucking way. Yeah, Jose. no. I, I'd give you that one easily because it is watchable sort of action film. You guys are good, mental. But it's not bad. Mm. I cannot. Which one are you going to plant your flag in? Well, I'm should curious. We, should now. we move on? It can't be Attack of the Clones. Should we move on to the second one? Yes, the worst film in the whole saga. History of cinema. I'm very interested to know, Calvin, if you know. Like, what was the vibe on set making this film? Because presumably on the first one, everyone was like, oh my god, Star Wars, so exciting, this is going to be brilliant. But on the second one, presumably everyone knows that they're coming back to make an awful shit sequel to a film <laughs> no one enjoyed. So, well, uh... were they desperate to, like, make up for the first one? Or were they just kind of like, let's just get through it? Still second most financially successful film of all time, at the time. Oh, you measure everything with money, Calvin. Hey, what's wrong with that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we are I'd like to make some money. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you know what? Honestly, I don't know. I think there was still probably a lot of um, goodwill at the time because, like, okay, George may have screwed up a little bit there, but. He can pull it back, and they got, like, an extra writer on this one. Jonathan Hales. Well, I just want to say, like, Yoda looks so shit in the last film, and he's he's CGI in this one, and all the better for it. As, as dirty as I feel saying that, like, they improved on a puppet with CGI, he's much better in this film than The Phantom Menace. Yep, yep. Not that people see him as a puppet in The Phantom Menace anymore, if you're watching the film in HD. And uh, Jar Jar... Binks makes a little cameo at the start of this, highlight of the film. Oh, he has more than a cameo. He becomes instrumental later on. But instrumental in that he gives the um, uh, Chancellor Palpatine the emergency powers. He's instrumental in getting the Senate to agree to bestow him with emergency powers that means he can get this clone army and do all of his evil stuff because he cons Jar Jar Binks into voting against what Natalie Portman would have done. So th- this second film, it, it opens in a um, a really un-Star Wars location, this kind of Earth-like cityscape. It's like Blade Runner or the Fifth Element or something. I mean, it's Coruscant. We were there in the previous film. Yeah, but, but it didn't okay. look like this. I mean, the CGI might have improved, but it's... Nah, it's like a grim nighttime. There's advertisements and like neon billboards and stuff. Mm. It doesn't look like anything in Star Wars up until this point. I, I agree with that later on when um, the Jedi go on their sort of... Neo noir investigative, yeah, yeah, yeah. When following of that criminal, and there's more, there's more video screens all over the buildings. So this technology is abundant. Yeah, seen the video technology. And... <laughs> Get over it, man. It's owned by the corporations. <laughs> uh, and then they they go to a 1950s diner. Which, uh, again, just, just mm. that's not what you get in Star Wars, is it? I mean, maybe it is. I mean, maybe I just kind of forget that, you know, the original trilogy was just, like, aping bars and... Well, I mean, th- there was a bar in that, uh, in-, in the first film, but it didn't feel like, oh, this is a take on an English pub, or this that's is a take it. on an American bar. There was something about it that felt like another world, yeah. another planet. Whereas yeah. now it feels like, like Futurama going to, like... The 1950s, yeah. oh, it's Marilyn Monroe bot, and, and and then they go into a library, and it's full of computers and books and records, so, um, like... But it is like an old-school stone-building library. But it's full of computers but and records yeah, and the it... internet. How are Jedi a myth in 20 years? <laughs> See, I, I don't remember in the original trilogy that the Jedis are a myth, because if I remembered that... Yeah, you know, it's probably The Force Awakens I'm taking issue with here. Yeah, it's the Force Awakens. Oh, yeah, well, like I guess this is what Jedi did. I don't know. It's it's really weird thinking of Jedi as just like private investigators that you hire and like, oh, yeah. could you protect this queen? It's like you just think of them as more like what That'd be a Alec Guinness is in though. Episode Four, just these like weird old men that live out in the middle of nowhere, but they've got these extraordinary powers. I guess it's a more religious view of it, but um, yeah, it, it just doesn't gel well with me. This whole thing where they're like doing their cop routine and whatnot, and he's trying to flirt with Padme. Yeah, Hayden Christensen um, as Anakin. Terrible. Are we all agreed? Yeah, he's not great. Really? Mm. Wait, what are you saying? What? Hey, what was the question? Hayden Christensen. Terrible? Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. Is it being uh, I guess we don't need. No, it's... we don't need to labour the point, I suppose. I don't know what, what we're meant to get from Anakin in these films. Because in the first film... Mm. You, it feels like you're meant to be endeared to him and think, oh, he's a great little kid, this Anakin. How bad that he turns yeah. evil at some point. But in the second film, he's suddenly mm. a creepy little shit. Are we meant to yeah. like him? And yeah. it's, or is it meant to be sowing the seeds? There's no journey, is there? Because he's immediately a, a wanker, like in the second mm. film. Like the second film should be the journey where he starts to turn. But I don't know. T- I don't know how much of it's intentional and how much of it isn't. That the first scene we see with him like flirting away with Padme in this one. But but he says, My mind is haunted by the kiss that you should not have given me. Has he been reading the game? That's like negging. That's like <laughs> full on emotional blackmail <laughs> manipulation. I mean, if you want to get into this, this the the whole relationship between those two was very, very poor. It was quite uncomfortable most of the time and I hated everything about it. My first note of it was was based on when they they meet again after 10 yeah. years or whatever it was. And my note was, oh my God, I'm supposed to believe that Anakin is in love with Amadala. 
I hate it already. But then the <laughs> fact that then she falls in love with him is even worse. Yeah. Him being a creepy little kid who's grown up as a monk and so he's never expressed these feelings. Yeah, and he's been wanking off over her every night, the one woman he's like yeah. met in his life, and he mm-hmm. hasn't got the internet because apparently records don't like <laughs> you can't get hold of videos in the Star Wars world. Yeah, he's looking for videos of her. He can't get them in the library. And he, he can't go off to the woods and find a scrap of like space porn because when he does find one, it's like a, a gun gun or something and he's not into it. But he could... <laughs> If the journey was him growing up and then sort of getting over that, that would be mm. all right. But it's not. It's like everyone goes, "Yeah, that's fine." I've got, oh, I've got one note that we've sort of, we've gone past because mine were chronological as well. When they first mentioned Count Dooku, they say something like, "Oh, Count Dooku, he was a Jedi once." I'm like, I didn't realize being a Jedi was something like you retired from. Is it like a job? I thought it was like an a thing. Like once you're a Jedi, always a Jedi. No, he was excommunicated. <laughs> Is that right? Is that how it works? Because obviously he went to the dark side, but that was something that's happened quite recently. But then he retired ten years ago or something. I didn't. I didn't quite get that. Yeah, I. I, I don't know. Like how the whole Jedi. I mean, it, it, this film does treat it like a job where you kind of do mm. it for a while and say, ah, "I'm going to give it up." But then does that just mean you have to agree to never use? You know, you can't just be sat at home and use your power to, like, bring yourself the TV remote or something. Yeah, and if you do, knock like... on the door. Samuel L. Jackson, John Travolta. <laughs> mm. Now, that'd be that'd be brilliant. Fuck, man, that should be the next Star Wars story spin-off. <clears throat> oh, man, Samuel L. Jackson and, and uh, John Travolta, but they're, like, Jedi cops going around, hitmen. Oh, so it's like a Mace Windu prequel, like, when he was a young Jedi coming up, and he was, he like, out investigating that. stuff oh, with his partner. That so good. Um... Talk, they, they could go into the 1950s diner and talk about the difference between cheeseburgers and uh, Hoth compared nice. to... I can't think of another Star Wars place. The Dagobah system. Oh, well done. Yay. Because they um, have the so metric my... system over in Dagobah system. <laughs> this sketch must exist on YouTube somewhere. There are things that bring up in these films that could, are nice ideas that could be explored and they're not. Like, for example... Mm. The idea of creating an army t- that's going to keep peace. Yeah. It's like that's, that is the grey kind of moral area of, of war and peace. And that's mm. an interesting thing that they just kind of brush over. It's just like, oh my God, mm. look, look, we've got an army. Oh, we can use that. And it's, it's like, it, I, I wish like they just got their teeth into some of these ideas. Little things like that. There's just like, there's, there's a lot of meat here that is not touched because they're too busy doing a shit love story that doesn't make any sense. Mm. So, is it this film that introduces the idea that Jedi can't marry? Or has that been introduced earlier? No, I think that's this. I mean, I can't talk about extended universe stuff. Isn't it a bit weird that these, like, religious authority figures not allowed to marry, so they hang around with young Padawan boys? <laughs> yeah, they, they take a boy yep. and raise him as... <laughs> I mean, this is a very sort of old school... It's, it's platonic, isn't it? It's, it's, this is what used to happen. And yeah, they used to fuck them as well, but that's not relevant. It's, they used to take a young, <laughs> a young boy apprentice and, and teach them everything they know. Um, you know, that's this is a long time ago. Remember, mm. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't know. <laughs> So we need to talk about um, Anakin goes back to Tatooine because he has a dream that his mum is in pain, and indeed she is, because sand people have kidnapped her, <laughs> um, and he gets that. and he he gets to her just in time, and she dies, and then he kills the women and the children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah mm. he does. He just brutally slaughters everything he sees. <laughs> mm. But then, yeah. but then C three PO's head gets put on a battle droid. My favourite bit in the whole film. I was about to say, I bet you fucking <laughs> loved this load of shit. Oh yeah, no, it's because they had to replace all the Jar Jar comic relief with C-3PO comic relief. It's just puns. This is such a drag. Oh, yeah. oh I'm oh, quite beside fucking. myself. Fuck off. You... <laughs> I hate you, C-3PO. Die. You're worse than Jar Jar. <laughs> no, he isn't. Now, Jar Jar, there's a good character. How is this worse than Jar Jar? This is the thing, you, you, you get on at Jar Jar for being stupid slapstick, and then you're into C-3PO going, Oh dear, oh, what a way to lose one's head. <laughs> I admit there are too many puns, but this is more in keeping with the original trilogy, where he would pop up every now and then and fall over and do something, whereas Jar Jar ruined literally every scene he was in. Jar Jar's in the best scene in this film. Uh, Jar Jar is the best thing about Attack of the Clones. His scenes come alive when he's on screen. 
<laughs> I'm not even joking. Like, genuinely. Yeah, I know you're not. I know you're not. That's Don't thing. rise to him, Calvin. He's winding you up. <laughs> you're just being provocative for provocative <laughs> His scenes are genuinely interesting. The puns were, were unacceptable, but the the concept of him just have, being there to break the action scenes up a little bit is fine, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's just it done so work, badly. But it's done very badly. And I don't yeah. like him being in the film. Like, it's the same thing of just, stop bringing the droids back. Give us some new droids. I mean, I agree that conceptually it doesn't make any sense mm. for him to come back. Like, especially, I've already mentioned Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. It makes no sense that he'd be living with them. And isn't there enough fan service in this one with Yoda having a big fight at the end anyway? Oh my god. Oh, do, does anyone have anything to cover before we get there? Because there's a big well, battle my, and everything. My, my last note is they've been fighting for about 45 minutes now. I don't know what's happening and I don't care. So yeah. that's where I kind of tuned out, I guess. So yeah, go ahead. I, I agree. I do lose um, a lot of understanding of what's happening when the clones arrive and then there are all these bug creatures and weird robot things. Just I don't quite so know who's on whose side. Unforgivably long. The whole film is. It's, yeah, it's oh, just yeah, not acceptable. Yeah. But then we do have a lightsaber battle um, between Christopher <laughs> Lee, uh, Obi-Wan, and Anakin. And that happens. And it quite clearly edits around the fact that Christopher Lee can't move and they can't <laughs> yeah. be bothered to CG his face <laughs> on a stuntman for most yeah. of it. Yeah. Because it's just a lot of close-ups of faces. with. But then Yoda comes in. He comes in doing his... Arr, 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 thing. And then he all of a sudden pulls out a lightsaber and flips into action. So, discuss. How did we feel about this? Um, I mean, when I was like 12, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> and now that I'm an adult, I thought it was awful. Um, oh. I, I, I'm getting the sense you enjoyed it, Calvin. Um, I'm conflicted, if I'm honest, because on the one hand, if you're going to say that this is the best Jedi master in the galaxy and he's the, you know, the the best, the greatest one that ever lived and all that kind of stuff. He needs to show that in some way and yeah. he has to be able to uh, jump into action. At the same time, that character design that, like, every, like, you've had him, like, stumbling around on this walking stick and then to do that just feels... Yeah. It just looks stupid. It looks really silly and I remember, like, I, I think I saw it in the cinema three times and every single time <laughs> everyone was laughing. It's um, just like, what... If, if this film was a meta, self-aware tongue-in-cheek thing, like, if it had a sense of humour more than some shit puns for, like, two minutes. If the film wasn't so mm. po-faced, yeah, it might have worked. But only insofar as it's, like, a silly kids movie, and this film doesn't mm. seem to feel that it is a silly kids movie. It seems to have delusions of grandeur. So, yeah, it just doesn't work at all. I, I didn't like it. I think it's... Mm. Although it's more interesting than most of the film, to be fair. So, it, you know, I shouldn't really be picking on it. I'd rather watch Yoda fight than most of it. But wouldn't it have been... Wouldn't it have been more interesting... And more satisfying to see that Yoda, because he is physically older and not as physically able, he fights in a different way. He uses the force in a different way. Mm. That would have been, and, and then use create something that, but it takes him like three or four seconds to rip this thing off the wall. Plenty of time for Yoda to force him in the stomach and then mm. jump somersault over to him and stab him. Like, why? Mm. Don't That's sit, a question, sta I'm just going to stand there and wait while you throw this thing at me. Can you, like, yeah. with the force, could you make, like, a blade of force and, like, chop someone's head off with it? Uh, like a really it's sharp, never happened, clean... I don't think. That's what you got your lightsaber for. Yeah, but say, say you want to, like, do a trick shot at them where you kind of swing with the lightsaber but then actually get them with the force from the other hand. Well, I think I don't think you can slice them with the force, but you can like push them back, and we've seen that happen with like droids and stuff. But if you if you refined the force down to like a pinpoint and then push I, that into them, would I, it penetrate and stab through I've them? Like never seen it done. They should do that in the next one. Mm. They should just have like invisible like stuff stabbed through a guy's head, and his brain is like impaled on a an invisible spike coming out of his ear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my my last note is the music's not too bad in this one as well, actually. Oh, I, no, I didn't remember I, I... any of the music going in, but listening to it, it's like, oh, okay, there's that romance theme and there's some stuff. I in love there. that romance theme, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. some decent stuff in there. So that was. So actually, just before we move on to the third one, I want to know how you two rank this one in comparison with the first one. Um, Sol, I'm going to guess that you like it more? 
No, it's obviously worse than The Phantom Menace. Come on. Oh, okay. It's obviously a much worse yeah. film. Well, not much worse. Oh, okay. it's, it's It's mildly worse, but it is worse. Okay. Definitively worse. I mean, yeah. mm. this is the worst Star Wars film I've seen. It's yes. worse than the. I, I it's, agree. it's worse than the middle one of the original trilogy. Mm. Easily. <laughs> but I mean, that was the shit mm. one of the middle trilogy, particularly shit one. I just, yes, the one that's regarded as the best. But you're you're, you're saying that like everyone's going to go, oh wow, he's taking a hard stance on, on Attack of the Clones <laughs> by saying it's worse than The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> but no, that, that was my reference point for the worst Star Wars film. I mean, look, I, I, I I'll agree. So. I also have the unusual opinion that Empire Strikes Back is the weakest of the original trilogy. Is that an but, unusual opinion? I, I think yes. not. I think it's objectively obvious. I How agree. Out of the loop are most you people with just pop culture? With Star culture? Wars people, I'm very No, but, I mean, <laughs> but it is clearly the least well-made film and i get that a lot of people like it on a personal level because it like touches certain buttons and things but uh, but anyway go and listen to our old star wars episode we cover this and explain mm. it but yeah like attack of the clones is you know i mean empire strikes back's better than phantom menace 2 and that's not that's not uh nothing controversial about that or do you think phantom menace is better than the empire strikes back alan is that what you're gonna say uh which one's the empire strikes back the one you hate <laughs> um <laughs> I would say no. I would say Phantom Menace was more watchable. Yeah. Right. Well, that's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I I don't even like Star Wars, and I don't get where you're coming from with that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Second one. So we we all agreed. Second one is dreadful. Worst one. Yes. Yes. Unless you count yes. the Star Wars Holiday Special, it's the worst Star Wars film. Um, that at least has well, camp value. We're not counting the Clone Wars animated uh, oh, I haven't seen film that. either, are we? Yeah, no. Oh well, maybe for next year's Star Wars season, we've got the holiday special and the Clone Wars to go at. Hooray! And those Ewok movies you mentioned last. Oh time. yes. Oh oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that droids cartoon. We're, we're set. Yeah, and the Last Jedi will be out by then. So brilliant, right? Revenge of the Sith. Can I tell you what my first note is? Yes. Because it's a big thing that I had a problem with with this film, uh, and in terms of the overall character arc here, of Amidala or Padme, that she's gone from this, you know, a, a leader, slightly naive perhaps, and being manipulated by other people, uh, but a queen of a planet or a state or whatever it is. Um, then the second film, she's a senator, you know, she's much more savvy. And then this third film, she is like a simpering girl. She's a, she's a pathetic creature who is like, oh, my lovely boy who I love, I just want to have babies with you. And it mm. really annoyed me. I hated the way her characters developed. Um, I thought, and you know, in a, in a, in a, in a world with feminism gone mad, this is uh, particularly galling. Well, it's interesting that you bring this up up front. I was going to hold off on this for a bit, but there was a lot of material with her removed from the film. I'm not sure yeah. if it was shot or if it was only scripted, but there was a. We were supposed to see, along with Anakin's descent into darkness, we were going to see the birth of the rebellion as an organization, and she was going to be instrumental in that, along with Bail Organa and Mon Mothma, who mm -hmm. the become Mothra, you know, Mothma, Mothman. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, they made a duck with teeth, <laughs> and we were supposed to see all these scenes of the three of them discussing like how, how are they gonna uh, take this um, this uh, evil empire on and all that kind of stuff. And so she was going to be instrumental in the rebels, um, which would have given her something to do. But no, instead she just sort of simpers around pregnant. For it would have made a lot of films. sense. Mm. It would have made a lot of sense. But yeah, really, it actually, it actually made me angry. But I did also note that. That is the only time I felt an emotion while watching this film. So, you know, fair play, they did something. I do really like this. Um, these first twenty minutes, by the way, it's sort of like a James Bond pre-credit sequence. Yeah, I did. It's I like really you just get thrown the into them. Yeah, they're in the middle of a mission to save the Chancellor. It, it, I, my note is, let's see, best opening to one of these films because they're like, let's get the Star War out of the way first. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I just think there's a lot of good stuff when they're in the ship and like they're in the lift shaft and the ship starts tilting, so they have to adjust what they're doing. Uh. My notes are quite disjointed here. Uh, I put this one feels like a PS3 game, so I guess the CGI has improved. Uh, <laughs> It was better, better than a PS2 game. Yeah, R2 is mainly CG now. I think. Um, I think. Mm. Well, I think everyone is mainly CG. Yeah. Um, and then I've got why is a robot cough, coughing? 
I don't understand. I made that exact oh. note. Why has this robot General got a cough? General Grievous. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah that's what it is. Right, okay, yeah. General Grievous, what's he about? The idea is that he is like, much like how Darth Vader later on becomes, you know, more machine than man, as they say. Oh. Um, this character also used to be man and is now mainly oh, machine, but okay. he just doesn't have the voice. He doesn't have the bre- breathalyzer thing that Darth Vader has, so he's coughing. Did they? Is that something you can get from the film, or do you have to read all the like accompanying uh, toy cards it's... and books to know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. That's... Here's a problem. Here's a problem with that though. It's if he's got like if his lungs work in a human way, or he's got a human throat that is c- causing him to cough. How come he escapes by jumping out into the vacuum of space? Well, that makes no sense. Because he, um... <laughs> if he's got any part of him that's human and using air, then yep, yep. Yeah, you're right. Uh, all right, R two D two is good at the start of this one. My note says so. I actually, I like him. Though. Oh, he's well, he's doing funny stuff. Yeah, he's like a little mission helper. He's like he's spraying oil on the ground and setting them on fire yeah. with oil and stuff. I don't know why he's better in this one than the other two, but it, it just works better here. It's uh, Christopher Lee very good in the lightsaber battle here. Well, well, yeah, they see they have the technology now to put his face on a much younger man. Well, I say, yeah, obviously he keeps going animated, but he like really sells it with his manic expression. Just like he looks mental. It's mm-hmm. like I guess he'd seen the outcome of the second film and knew what they were going for. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. I-, I love that moment when um, Anakin disables him, he chops off both his hands, and then the Emperor's like, go on, Anakin, kill him. And he, like Christopher Lee just looks at the Emperor and he's sort of like, what? Are you serious? Like, really? <laughs> and then he chops his head off. The the violence is um, more pronounced in this one. Um, I suppose later on we'll talk about it Because this is a dark, more. gritty Star Wars film. Yeah, I dark, mean, I don't know what rating this film has gritty. in America. Maybe it's PG-13, but certainly in the UK it was a 12, which was the first was time that... Yeah, after like yeah. episode four, five, six, one. Oh, but twelve A had very recently been introduced, hadn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I I've made a note that I was sick of the scream that R two D two does about six times in a row, just the same sound effect. I fucking hate. It was like just fuck off, stop it. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Feels like yeah. like if you get a Furby and you just keep kicking it and it keeps going like. <laughs> and it's the same recording like six times yeah. in a row. And I guess it's authentic. He's a robot. He probably has this one scream recording noise that he just does every time. But fuck me. And then we've got um, boring relationship shit brings it down. But oh, then... but Sol, you have your um, you your Jar Jar has a single line in this film. Oh, remind me. He says, "Excuse me, excuse me." <laughs> And that's it. And C-3PO's uh, got gold. He's um, he's gold now. Um, now he finally gets his gold because he's um, Padme's personal droid now. He's pretty he's sort of like a butler, really. <laughs> oh, so she's just flaunting her wealth in like the ta- like Saddam Hussein with his <laughs> gold palace and gold toilet seat. She's like, yeah, yeah. paint the paint the droid gold because I'm a royal. <laughs> Um, and there's a Wookiee army. That's pretty good. Oh yes, because uh, we go to Kashyyyk, which is the Wookiee homeworld. And um, talking about making the universe feel smaller, Chewbacca is in this uh, film. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? And, and it's like, revealed that he knew Yoda. Yeah, uh, mates with Yoda, and apparently like the the leader of of some, of some capacity. Are you sure it's Chewie? Yeah, he calls him Chewbacca. Yes. Yeah, but that, and then he says goodbye, Chewbacca. Yeah, but Chewbacca might be like Muhammad on Earth. It might be like the most common name in the planet. Yeah, it just well, looks it's the same similar. actor. <laughs> How can they all you look tell? alike to me, anyway. Those Wookies. But yeah, this is the section where there was supposed to be a young boy fighting with the Wookies that would have been Han Solo, and the idea is that he <laughs> would have been brought up on the Wookie planet, which would have been horrible. Yeah, that would be goodness, pretty awful. I mean, it's bad enough that Chewbacca's there because it's like so he's gone from being like a. A leader, a Wookiee leader to like some mercenary who just hangs out with this. He's not even like the captain of his own ship. He's just sort of like yeah. Han's pet dog. He's an alcoholic. Oh. He's an alcoholic. Oh, that's interesting. Because, mm. you know, it's, it's sort of, we have a lot of Attack of the Clones style boringness with Anakin and Padme, and she reveals that she's pregnant, and then there's a load of stuff like. The Jedi are just a really horrible organization oh, in this God, film. Yeah. There's a lot of They're like dreadful. Anakin's obviously going through a lot of emotional trauma, and Yoda's response is mourn them, mo- mourn them not, miss them not, and it's like, well, sorry, sorry that I've got emotions and I'm a a, mm. a creature that can feel empathy and get upset. He basically says it. Get over fucking. <laughs> is that is that the right syntax? I don't know how he, <laughs> how he's ordered. No, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I made a very similar note actually, basically saying, am I supposed to be on the Jedi side? Because I don't, I'm not. <laughs> I, don't I don't know, trust are them. you? Because maybe you're meant to be rooting for Anakin. Maybe this is a very clever well, film was... that helps you see the villain's perspective. Well, I was thinking that, but but he slaughters children. Well, there you go. That's that's uh, that's how you know which one's more evil, isn't it? But... Yeah, exactly. But I was <laughs> thinking that maybe they're doing a good job of of creating Anakin as a kind of morally grey character, but that's not in keeping with these films, is it? It's hard to know because. Mm. Yeah, I think it's just badly thought through, badly made, and they were trying, they just done a bad job of portraying the Jedi, but it feels like they're trying to portray moral ambiguity in grey areas in this film, and I think that's an accident, mm. <laughs> but... Because when, ch- yeah. when the Chancellor is trying to win over Anakin, I'm like, yeah, he's right. You've been in a religious cult, you've been brought up in a religious cult yeah. as a child, so you don't know any different. Mm. You believe what they say, but what they're saying is suppress everything, don't have feelings, um, and then go and kill people when we ask you to. And it's like, that is a bit weird, actually. But yeah, there's a big turning point scene where uh, so like uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Palpatine are having a like spat, and Hayden Christensen's there, and like Samuel L. Jackson's about to kill Palpatine, and he's like, mm. no, he needs to stand trial and all that. Fair point, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. That's the whole, the, you know. Um, they are they, they are the whole, they are there to uphold justice and peace. I believe ex- exactly. Rather than um, summarily executing someone, that's it. They need to be <laughs> bigger than you know the the. That's the whole point of their fucking organization. So he quite rightly lightsabers Samuel L. Jackson's hand off. Uh, to save Palpatine, but but then but then Palpatine like attacks Samuel L. Jackson back, and for some reason he doesn't like saber Palpatine's hand off to save Samuel L. Jackson. So what's that about? <laughs> or even if he didn't do it in time, didn't go. Yeah. Oh, hang on, you're not quite the nice guy I thought you were. You are actually a shit. But he has loads <laughs> of time. Because Samuel Jackson kind of goes, whoa, whoa, and then he's like flailing his arms around, about to go falling, and then he like it, it goes on for about a minute before he actually falls, with him teetering on. The all end. the while, all the while, the the old shriveled worm that you just saved is like screaming ultimate power, like while he's killing mm. a man. It's like uh, I'm not sure you're on the right side here. It really, really bothers me that, by the way, just while we're talking about this bit, that um when Palpatine is trying to like electrocute. Mace Windu, um, he uses his lightsaber to bounce the electricity back at him and it like melts his face for some reason, um, which is really annoying because when the, I guess it's to explain the Emperor's appearance in the next trilogy, yeah. mm. um, but I always just liked the idea that he was just like a really old man and he'd done some kind yeah. of like, deal with the devil and he was actually like 200 years old but the evil was keeping him alive I don't like that it was an instantaneous yeah, thing all of a sudden his eyes are a different colour it's a small thing but it's always really bugged me no I agree this is when we get Order 66 and all the uh, Jedi warriors are being executed around on different planets and we have we have cute little Master Anakin what's going on where's Master Yoda and then he like <laughs> doesn't it seem like he just they could have hinted at him being that evil a bit more oh it just well, I know he like he did murder yeah, all those yeah. sand people I know but... but that was in a fit of rage after his mum died That's it. it's the, a different... this is this is he's killing innocent kids like it's, it it feels like a big step up from anything we've seen before mm. That the, yeah. you know, uh, th- there's more. I could buy Luke Skywalker doing it more than him because he used to like kill mm. defenseless little animals, shooting at them, and is just <laughs> for fun. So shooting one, yeah. So why just give us a few scenes of like Anakin shooting like a lizard for a joke and laughing at it? Open mm. the film on him with like a magnifying glass, killing ants, and I'll be like, <laughs> all right, I get it. He's a sociopath. Fine. And it, and it's not like he just had to press a button where he could kind of disassociate it from somewhere. Like m- slicing people up with a lightsaber is very personal. Like you you will hear mm. and all that many as well. Like you'll kill the first one and then you have to kind of chase the others around the yeah. room while they're screaming. <laughs> and he probably had to use the force to like strangle some of them, throttle. Them. Yeah, you have, you have to really get involved with that. So um, yeah. Well, this is the whole problem with this trilogy in concept. The whole point is, and they talk about in the original trilogy, that Anakin Skywalker was seduced by the dark side. And he's not really seduced, he's duped. The Emperor Mm. tells him a lie. He's like, oh, actually, well, if you come and, you know, do what I want you to do, then I'll tell you how you can make your your wife live forever. Um, Even though he doesn't know. And that's it. He's just a bit of an idiot, really. Mm. It's all very unsatisfying, isn't it? Because, like... Ultimately, yeah. the wife leaves him because of who he's become. And it's like that, that's obviously a big moment, like where he should realize that he's fucked it all up and kind of go back. And that's when he has the, the turn and, and goes, Oh my God, what have I done? I'm going to 
kill the emperor and like he kind mm. of he, he dies himself but saves the rest of the world kind of thing but obviously you can't do that because you've got three more films to, mm. <laughs> to to make work so at the end they're, they're having a big fight with lightsabers and they fall into the yes. big senate hall and they're fighting. Oh, uh, Yoda and Emperor Palpatine. That's actually one of my favourite moments in the film when those two have a little fight. Just because that is like, that's mm. pure fan fiction. That, that should not exist. But wouldn't that scene, like, shouldn't that scene have been the same? But the crowd, like, the, the Senate room was full of all the people. <gasps> and they all just start, like, cheering and, like, betting Quatloos on oh, them and that fist pumping. Oh, that brilliant. When they're flinging the um, podium things around at each other, some senses yeah. like still in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. And that's that where you put brilliant. your your Wilhelm scream in. So, someone goes, ah! <laughs> And and then it really annoys me that so Anakin subdued to the dark side. Obi Wan doesn't even try to to save him. Uh, after <laughs> no, that he's like, well, that's it. He, You've that's gone. It. he just lets him fall into lava and die a horrible death, burning alive. Oh! He doesn't even walk up to him and lightsaber him in, in the head to put him out of his misery. Yeah, just stomp on his head like he a, just walks off a raccoon on the on the side of the road. <laughs> Is, I mean, is that the Jedi no, no, way, to just leave him suffering? To punish him? <laughs> well, this is this is after he's been like, you were my brother. Yeah. You know, I loved you more than anything else, and I'm going to watch you. I've cut off both your arms and one of your... Oh, no, both your legs and one of your arms. And now I'm just going to watch you burn. <laughs> oh, but that bit is so funny, isn't it? When he... Because he's just like... He's just like slowly sliding down the pebbles and then he catches fire. It's hilarious just how it's all filmed and staged. I think it's really hilarious. But that was the final straw for me that made me like mm. hate the Jedi. My note here is fuck Jedi. I think they're the real mm. villains yeah. of this piece. They're awful. Mm. Although I have to say, Yui, Yui McGregor really brings his A-game mm. to that last bit, that We Were Brothers bit. Like it, oh, yeah. it feels like he's actually... It's the first bit of acting in the entire prequel trilogy, basically. Yeah. Oh, the first bit of legit, like, someone's trying and accomplishing something. Yeah, yeah. It annoys me, just on, uh, just while we're talking about this area, that they have this huge fight around this lava planet, and they're going down all these lava you know, streams and all this kind of stuff off machinery. It's great. The, the fight basically ends because, as Obi-Wan says, he has the higher ground. He's slightly a bit further up on this hill. It's a big advantage. And Well, yeah, but the fact that it's, like, it's this little hill that's, like, all of, like, what, eight foot... You know, you need. difference. I know, but it annoys Although me. Although he is that. a Jedi that could leap 20 feet into the air and just jump over him to the other side, thinking. Well, about... exactly. It's like. Oof. Well, obviously, not yeah. quite far enough because he just chops his legs off. But, like, yeah, all maybe. throughout this fight, one of you was often higher up than the other one, or there were opportunities where you could have done similar things. Well, there's loads of points scary. where both there's two of them going against one person, and they kind of just line up and attack yeah. one at a time. But it's like, but it's <laughs> it's um it's Alec Guinness. He's he's playing mind games. He's getting in his head. He says it's over. <laughs> I've won. There's no point fighting me. I've won, and he knows that's going to get to him. And He's going to panic and do a make a rash decision and do a jump he shouldn't do. And then he does it and he gets his leg chopped off. It's his tactics. Hmm. So Natalie Portman dies of a broken heart. <sighs> Medically healthy, but uh, dying of we a broken heart. We don't know. Heart. She's just lost the will to live. No, you see, well, no, that'd be fine. If, if she, well, not fine, but like I could, if she was like really severely ill and they said like, look, she, she should be able to pull through from this, but she just seems to have lost the will to like even try I don't know, I could go with that. But but they say she's medically healthy, she's fine, but she's just lost the will to live and, and she's dying. So um I've heard theories about this. I've heard theories that well, like the Yoda theory. is like well no, that Yoda is transferring her life force into the two kids, or the midichlorians are just doing that naturally, or the Emperor is transferring her life force into Anakin because he's nearly dead. But it's all just like none of that's in the film. It's just fans mm, like yeah, trying to that. Babies generally have their own life force. It's sort of Yeah. <laughs> all that's intercut with the birth of Darth Vader. Yes, which is like a Frankenstein pastiche and is a pretty great scene. I, I like it. Mm. The Emperor had all the gear ready to go he was like okay i know what i need for this i need some leather i need a cape i need like a little <laughs> machinery box thing on his chest that no other character in the universe has I'm not even sure what all those buttons do it's a special box no other characters have been set on fire like that yeah but it's purpose built very quickly well technology moves it's a well-equipped uh hospital that can you know bash they've got robots that build <laughs> stuff for them I think it's that that design, that character design, feels so jarring coming after a film where, you know, we've had General yeah, Grievous I, I, yeah, I, and his yeah. forearms and yeah. 
I don't know, there's something... I, yeah. There's been something very clunky the... and, like, really this is the best version of, like, the life support that you could give him. I don't know. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It's... Mm. And then, of course, he goes... Yeah. No! <laughs> oh, again, laughter in, in the cinema. I only saw this one once at the cinema, but there was pretty big... Yeah, it's 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 very unfortunate that that is supposed to be the climax of the emotional journey of the movie. Yeah. And then uh, Jar Jar shows up at the funeral all sad. It's hilarious, but it's the best part of the film. <laughs> Does he like, accidentally fall into the coffin and the body drops out? And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, he's matured. He's grown as a character. <laughs> oh. And then um, the Death Star's coming along pretty quickly, isn't it? You're complaining about a little box yeah. on his chest that they've made like that, <laughs> but they've built half a fucking planet within the space of yeah. like... Yeah, and they've got a um, a young sort of CG Peter Cushing there. They've built half of it, but it takes 20 years for him to get it up and running. By the, cause by the time the, the next film... Yeah. Like, how old's Luke supposed to be? 20? Uh, Yeah, 25. I think it's like 20, 25 years in between this So that's and how long it takes one. him to get the Death Star properly running. So it's probably just a shell. Uh, and they have to put all the piping mm. in and stuff. I can't, I can't remember the original trilogy that well enough, but when Yoda turns up, when um, mm. when he, Luke turns up at Yoda, is Yoda like, oh, I didn't know there was a, any Jedi's left, or is he like, ah, Luke, I've been expecting you, kind of thing? That is a very good question. I've never actually thought about that. I was just going to say he must know it's Luke because he, I mean, he's named at birth. Uh, it's not as if that name is given to him by his aunt and uncle. I mean, would it have been, in terms of hiding him, would it have been good to change his surname? <laughs> Is it a bit obvious? Yeah, you'd think. You'd think, wouldn't you? <laughs> Isn't Luke a biblical name? Yes. Well, the, the Bible wasn't <laughs> written for... Star Wars is set, like, a long time... I mean, maybe it's set after the Bible was written. Maybe it's only set, like, 50 years in the past, when it says a long time a long, ago. A long time ago. Yeah. There's that whole bit in um, Return of the Jedi where Luke is revealing to Leia that they are siblings, and he's like, do you remember Mother? And she's like, yes, yes, I do remember her. I remember her being very happy. And it's sort of like, oh, what, in the 30 seconds that she was alive after you were While born? We were in the womb. She was never happy at any point during, <laughs> during her entire relationship with Anakin. False memories are a thing, though. People, it's very easy to plant a false memory in someone's head about childhood. Hmm. Anyway, my point is that there are huge inconsistencies between the prequels and the original trilogy, and it's probably best off just to ignore the prequels. <laughs> well, so the third one, though. Your favourite, I'm guessing. Of the prequels, yeah. Without, without a shadow of doubt. Mm. Stupid, full of bad dialogue, but for the most part, decent, entertaining film. Much, much better than The Force Awakens. To be honest, I would put it only like one notch below The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. I'd say roughly on par with those two. I, I for a while this I I thought of this as my favorite of the prequels for for sure. I think it has some good action. It's stupid, but it's it's certainly it's entertaining. Ed, the most entertaining. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think that it has a great moments but also probably the lowest moments of the entire because everything that has built up like this is supposed to be the connective tissue between um, i don't care about any of that shit the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy and it drops the ball on far too many things and doesn't wrap up enough uh, elements satisfactorily but um, you're giving the earlier two a free pass because they can drop the ball and then it's all on the third one to pick it up and deal with it i mean i th i think the thing is i don't give a shit about the bigger picture with star wars so i'm viewing these as individual films and i think as an individual mm. whole the third one is by a mile the best film of the prequel series easily i i preferred the phantom menace it felt just more like the fun action film it's supposed to be but i think that in your case alan is something that you seem to do a lot on this podcast where you'll watch like 10 <laughs> films in a day and so you like the first one yeah, the most i was because it's like no i <laughs> Yeah, I watched The Phantom Menace like a couple of days before and then I watched those, those second two back to back and it was pretty brutal and I, yeah, my, my, I may not have had the focus that I should have. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I just felt like it was totally pointless. I mean, yeah, I'll agree mm. with that. Well, what, what ratings did you give them? That's probably the easiest way to compare. I mean, I've got mine. I can tell you mine. Yeah, what do you give them, Alan? Actually, hang on, hang on, hang on. So for context, can we have your ratings for the original trilogy? Yes. Okay, All so right. Star Wars yeah. original. Yeah. Eight, oh, okay. good solid action film. The second one, which is gone. 
Um, that's a question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. Uh, Empire Strikes Back 5. It was shit. The next one is... Return of the Jedi. That one I gave a better mark than the second one. Uh, six for that. So then Phantom Menace I gave six. Oof, um, fucking hell, that's but, high. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, it was just a palatable film. I didn't particularly enjoy it. But no, it, was, it wasn't. Uh, as a kid's film, I think. I think if I ever saw it as a child, it probably, you know, it does what it's supposed to. Then the, the next one, Attack of the Clones 3, it was awful. And then mm. Revenge of the Sith I've given five. Mm. Um, mm. But I just totally tuned out of it. It was boring. Kevin? Uh Well, I um, I believe I gave the first Star Wars Episode 4, I, 9 Whew. out of 10. Episode 5, 9. Episode 6, 10. That's, that's, that's literal madness. And um, Phantom Menace. Uh, <laughs> it's a sharp inhalation of the heavens. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, and then... Um, Episode one, I'm gonna have to give it a six. Fuck me, you guys love The Phantom Menace. <laughs> uh, I don't love it. Six um, out of ten from Calvin's a pretty damn respectable score. You, you... Oh, it's respectable, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go six, and then I'm also gonna go three, and then five. Oh, you guys are So mad. I think we have the same scores for the prequels, Alan. Ooh. Don't know what's going on. What about you, Sol? Um, I give ten stars and all the Oscars to episode three. Best <laughs> episode <laughs> three is the best Star Wars of all of them. And here's why. <laughs> Star Wars Holiday Special is the best Star Wars. And I'm not even <laughs> joking. <laughs> No, the thing is that that is it's, it's it's not even that it's an unpopular opinion that episode three is the best of the prequels because that is what yeah, it's most, the general consensus. What the consensus yeah. normally is um, <laughs> right. I would go seven out of ten for Star Wars, the first one. It's all right. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna have to do like halves here because otherwise it's all gonna be the same. Uh, Six point five for the Empire Strikes Back. Oh 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 oh. Return of the Jedi, same thing. Six point five marginally better, mm, okay. I would say, than Empire Strikes Back. And then The Phantom Menace 4 out of 10. Oh. Because it's shit. <laughs> like, it's not even it's it's not even that it's a bad Star Wars film, which seems to be how you two feel about it. It's a bad film. <laughs> You're very uh, angry with us. Yeah, this. because it's awful. <laughs> it's so I, shit. I don't... Anyway, uh, Attack of the Clones, I've given 3.5. Yeah. So, slightly worse. Than Phantom Menace, but there's not a lot in it. They're about as bad as each other, roughly. And then Revenge of the Sith, 6.5 again. So mm. almost exactly on par with Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Huh. But I would say slightly, like, if I was ranking them, I'd put it below those two. But only just. Well, that was interesting. Reven like, Revenge of the Sith isn't bad. That's the thing. I think that's a genuinely passable film. <laughs> the other two are genuinely shit. I just can't believe it. I think it's passable. That's why I gave it a five. But then you gave The Phantom Menace a six. That means you love The Phantom Menace. Yes, because... You're mental. <laughs> if, if, you sat me, if you sat me down and, uh, and gave me a choice, if it was Desert Island and I only have to pick one Star Wars prequel to be with me... I'd just kill myself. Then it would be... <laughs> you'd pick the one with the most Jar Jar and then you'd sit there whining about Jar Jar the whole time. <laughs> 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 mm. Bloody hell. Right. Should we, should we do our... Pitches. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I was like, I have nowhere to go with this. I wasn't engaged with it enough to really get into it, so I kind of went with a stupid, silly idea. Oh, well, me too. Yeah. Well, I think it, because we know where it goes after this for the story, so it's not like you can do something different. Do uh, a spin off. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I did a kind of spin off. Right, well, do, uh, do, uh, do you want to go? I'll go first. <laughs> Porky Pig, then. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to have to fudge the ending a little bit of that last film because basically I want my sequel to be um, a comedy. Following Obi-Wan and Yoda, uh, they they have to go into hiding because their particular branch of religion isn't popular anymore. So they uh, <laughs> they find some like shit old planet in the back of the universe and go into hiding. But of course they... Dagobah. Yeah, but they, they in, my, in my 
plot, they have to take the Jedi babies with them, the, the twins. And so it's just a, a classic odd couple style comedy in which two mismatched bachelors have to raise a, a couple of babies. Uh, they don't know anything about babies, guys. What are they going to do? Imagine the hilarity. One of the so he did buy those cancer sticks after all. He drops it on the floor. <laughs> the other one walks over and like forces it up with the force and like goes, <laughs> "Look at this bloody cancer stick." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, death stick, death stick. I mean, pl- please feel free to throw in some ideas. I've got, a, I've got a few. I mean, I, this is supposed to be a film. It kind of turned more into a sitcom. Well, the Odd Couple was a film before it became a sitcom, yeah, so you yeah, know. Exactly. You need another um, character in there, so it can be three men and a baby, but it'd be three men. Jar Jar. Well, <laughs> yeah, Jar Jar in it. Well, well I, I did have an, an idea where, like, none of them know how to change the nappy, but because it smells so bad, like Yoda's trying to do it with the Force from about twenty feet away. <laughs> But then, like, he accidentally <laughs> he loses control, yeah, it flies like steady, through a window, and, and it splatters across the washing on the line in the garden. And like, oh, no, we've got to wash them again now. But it's it's the neighbours washing. <laughs> they keep, yeah. They keep, oh, I've they're, got... trying to, they're trying to make a good impression with the neighbour. <laughs> so I've got, I've got a neighbour character who's, like, he's always, like, he's really... St- uh, suspicious of them because he keeps seeing things like floating in the garden and stuff like because they're obviously yeah, three to not be three Jedis. men all living <laughs> together <laughs> yeah nothing wrong with that in the old days <laughs> this is a long time <laughs> ago in a galaxy far, yeah, far we didn't away. know but yeah like this really nosy neighbor and he keeps seeing things and he's like margaret they're at it again come and have a look at this and then his his <laughs> wife his wife runs up but she never the sees Yorkshire it planet. it's always it's always like it's always like stopped by the time she goes, so she thinks he's like going mad, and like so he didn't believe her. But I was thinking like they could like because you don't want to have three three men and a little two babies. Yoda like has to pretend to be like the elderly grandmother, <laughs> wears a shawl to cover his ears, and he's like, "Oh, that's good. I'm just a little old, a little old lady, am I?" So. <laughs> I haven't got a lot of plot, but I thought I'm going to have to create some drama at some point. So, like, a bounty hunter is going to come and, uh, like, find them. I mean, it could be it mm. could be the little fat boy. Uh, maybe, Boba Fett. Um, who's, well, like, he's, like, still a trainee bounty hunter because he's only 12 or whatever. But, yeah, just something that creates the drama that they have to actually deal with something. But then they, like, have to fight him off, but then they're not... They're trying to be in hiding, so they, they're not allowed to use the force. So they're, like, having to try and fight him off. In a way that's like not hmm. obvious, because the vicar's coming around for tea. Uh, but then, yeah, so they can have a big battle, like um, get a load of droid soldiers in or something, so they've got things to kill. And then they could have the the bit where the neighbour is watching through the window again, going, "Margaret, there's a bloody great big battle going on in front garden. What's going on here?" <laughs> and she's like, she doesn't even look anymore because she's like, she doesn't believe him. They've got really good double glazing; she can't hear anything. Uh, <laughs> but then, but then, just just when it looks like, um, just when it looks like. They're beaten and like the bounty hunter is about to kill them. The neighbor comes and like smacks him over the back of the head with a shovel. And then Yoda and Obi Wan are like, What? What's going on? And he goes, Hey, why didn't you tell me you were bloody Jedi's? My brother were a Jedi. He's Mace Windu. Hey, that bloody daft oh. Apeth Emperor killed him. I'm on your side. Long live the resistance. Oh. And then, uh, and then, the... what a twist. <laughs> and then, I d- it could be played by Samuel Jackson if he can do a Yorkshire accent. It's like his twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was mine. Just sort of a, sort of an assortment of comedy ideas. That no real plot to hold them together. <laughs> so, well, um, on on that same vein, shall I do my pitch next? Okay. Mine is a political sitcom called Yes Emperor, <laughs> and it. <laughs> And it stars Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> yes. We're going to set it... Jar Jar isn't actually going to be the Emperor, but this is set between episodes three and four, and it's a sitcom about um, what happens, like... Maybe maybe at the end of the series, he can become the Emperor, and then you do a spin-off series. Called... Yeah, that's it. Yes, Senator, and then Yes, Emperor. Yes, okay, Yes, Senator, we'll call it then. And yeah, it's basically because the Emperor's like taken over the political system so what happens next and it's all about the fallout so jar jar banks is um made the new minister of um administrative affairs Excellent. and uh he, yep yep and um he gets given he, he seems to be doing a good job though jar jar for however long he's in that position in the trilogy well i think he's kept there because he's easily manipulated um he's probably not much of a threat <laughs> uh He's like the Jacob Rees Mogg of. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, he's he's very. I mean, that that is the guy from Yes Minister. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't cause waves. Does what he's told. 
Yeah. Why it fits so perfectly. Now, I can't decide, because obviously he needs to have a foil in political office. Like, Jar Jar probably genuinely wants to do the best mm. um, C-3PO. that he possibly can. But Well, I was thinking C-3PO, but then that would mess with the continuity. <laughs> well, we couldn't have that. <laughs> R2-D2. He, he, he would make the... <laughs> He's wily. <laughs> well, he, he knows stuff. I think C-3PO would be the natural fit, wouldn't he? Because he would be the one sort of saying, oh, well, yes, you, uh, you think you're doing the right thing for the uh, sand people, but in actuality... No, because C-3PO doesn't come across as particularly competent. Yeah, he'd be the Derek Folds character. Mm. The, what, the, the the personal secretary, or whatever, personal private secretary. He's the one who kind of like, he knows when to do as he's told by the people who actually yeah. hold the real power, but he mm. theoretically is subservient. But R2-D2 is the Machiavellian pulling the strings. Guy. Yeah, that's it. Nigel Hawthorne. Can you imagine doing one of those big like Nigel Hawthorne monologues but all in beeps? And it's like all word <laughs> beepy wordplay. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. R two D two is Nigel Hawthorne's um character from Yesminster, by the way. We're we're doing Yesminster here. Um which is a BBC sitcom about politics. And then C three PO he does a load of beeps and then C three PO goes, He's right, Minister. <laughs> there's no subtitles in it. I think it writes itself really this I think it's uh... yeah good so you have a pitch also you did say in our in our Star Wars episode from months back you said you said you just wait until we do the prequels and I do a Jar Jar <laughs> pitch so <laughs> it's gonna be the Jar Jar show right yeah okay alright I, I want to do a a sincere legitimate attempt to retroactively make Phantom Menace a bit less shit by imbuing Jar Jar with some darkness that he's masking. Darkness in his soul. Ah. He uses humour as a defence mechanism Mm. because he's a damaged... damaged (laughs) Tears of a clown. Yeah, exactly. You know what some fans have done, actually? Um, Some fans have, like, there's plenty of fan edits of Star Wars films out there. Someone, like, edited all three prequels into one two-hour movie. Yeah, that was Thomas Hayden Um, Church, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Uh, Maybe it was the other one from Spider-Man 3. Because what uh, what someone did with Jar Jar was um, they took out all of his dialogue and put in like alien speak, just like, you know, a foreign language, and then gave him subtitles. Um, But they were like quite smart subtitles. No, what you want to do is you keep Jar Jar the same, but you put canned laughter over all of his scenes. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that, that would work, actually. But his species just has like this weird effect where it sounds like canned laughter when they're like distressed. That's what it is in universe. <laughs> but but yeah, like people call Jar Jar racist and they call him out over the weird like Asian stereotype aliens and and Watto a lot of the time because uh, because they say he's like a black stereotype apparently. And in terms of his voice, I mean, it's nothing to do with like. American black, maybe like no, I agree. kind I, of Caribbean pigeon English sort of weird speech. No, I, I think people don't like it because they think it's a kind of like Uncle Tom slave kind of archetype that he falls hmm. into. And I mean, I, I'm not convinced by it. I, I think if you're going to get upset about the racial stereotypes in the Star Wars universe, Jar Jar's like bottom of the list I'd look oh, at. Please do not be upset about <laughs> my voice. <Exactly. laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, as we've already touched on, there's a there's a weird like slavery subtext in in the, particularly the Phantom Menace, but it's it's permeated throughout the entire Star Wars universe, quite frankly. So I, I want to kind of tackle that head on because I think it's a really weird thing that just kind of sits there in the film and doesn't really get addressed. So mm. it's called Jar Jar Unchained. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a it's really? a gritty, sincere character piece prequel about Jar Jar <laughs> as a young man. Uh, back when he was a slave on a plantation owned by one of the uh, Jabba the Hutt clan, one of the Hutt family. So he's get going about his business, and then some some renegade bounty hunter. Like if if he wanted, it could be like Han Solo's dad, but I don't want to tie it into the original films too much, uh, as we've as we've uh, talked about that it cheapens the whole thing. So just some new guy. He comes and sets them free, not because of like moral issues he has with slavery, but because there's some financial incentive to do it for him for 
So then Jar Jar goes on the run on his planet, and he's he's riding on the back of one of those alien horses, like a western, you know, uh, looking for a spaceship mm. to to escape on. He meets other freed slaves along the way, he leads them to freedom. Uh, eventually, he kills the hut leader person. So you know, it's a simple, basic plot, but it's one that treats Jar Jar with reverence and makes you care for him. Uh, makes him genuinely quite badass as well, you know. Put some sunglasses on him in the third act, that sort of thing. Give him a big gun. <laughs> Make him cool. Give mm. him some attitude. But then the, the most tragic part is that at the end of the film, he's, he's completely lost, and he just doesn't really know what to do with himself. He was a slave, but now he's a free man, and he doesn't really know how to handle it. So then, in The Phantom Menace, him springing up with that life debt he comes out with, that represents an attempt that he makes to, you know, somewhat subconsciously go back to being a slave, because it's safe mm. and familiar, and it's what he knows. It's what he knows, but he feels like it's more under his control because he's doing it with honour. Yeah. Yeah, and and then so then when he becomes a member of the council uh, later on, he has this internal struggle because he hates himself for this. Um, you know, he's completely internalized it. So then we have a sequel, uh, revisiting Jar Jar in his days as a politician, and and so <laughs> or it could be Calvin's thing. Uh, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> focusing on his past as a slave, basically how that's like royally fucked him up, and he's you know he's he's trying to trying to come to terms with the fact that he's a free man and and he's internalized this uh, yeah so so that's my mm. my Jar Jar film. I mean, how mm. how do we explain the fact that he's a bit of a dopey cunt and he can't like walk yeah. two steps without falling over something? Because he's got big ears. I'm stepping in some shit. <laughs> Because he knows that if you want to like avoid conflict and avoid a beating, yet another beating, yeah, it's a good oh, defense yeah, mechanism been... to appear kind of. Yeah, he's been brought up in a place where being clever is not a, not not something to the show. Exactly. Uh, so you play play the fool, step and fetch it, and uh, exactly and, you're, dis- uh... you're, you're disarming if you're foolish and like. But then, then you could do you, what you could do is like literally the film as it the films as they are, but. Jar Jar Binks's perspective, and so he does the kind of oh, I'm so, so sorry, yeah, and then he kind of goes around the corner. Is like, right, let's gonna... do it. It's a Jar then, Jar then you, trilogy. You see, you see him like he's conniving behind it, but like for good. It's a Jar Jar trilogy. I like that. It's a Jar Jar trilogy. Film one, so it's it's Jar Wars, episode one, Jar Jar Unchained, then episode two, Rosencrantz and Guildstein are Jar Jar or something. <laughs> And you see it all from his perspective. And then episode three, Yes Minister Jar Jar edition. (laughs) Working title. Uh, Which one are we looking at next? We're doing um, Rogue One next. So we're breaking from chronology of production to do this. But technically that one, I think we're doing that one at the right. That is next, chronologically speaking, in terms chronologically, of internal yes. continuity. Um, but yeah, Rogue One, I think it's good to talk about immediately after these prequel films. Because um, it arguably does a lot of what these films should have done. Mm. But more on that next week. <laughs> Right, well, uh, 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 do you want to go?